1. This happened in 1981. I was 19 years old and attending a Halloween party. The party was held on the second floor in the student union at the college I attended. There was a rumor that one of the punch bowls was spiked with alcohol. I didn't know which one, but I took several drinks from one and felt wonderful. During the movie I left. I don't remember walking down the stairs, but I remember getting on a banister, and then waking up, sitting on the bottom step, sleeping. Somehow I didn't fall and hurt myself. I decide it's time to head home. I don't remember where my car is, so I decide to walk downtown and then try to find it later. I was dressed in a harem outfit and had four-inch heels on. I got up and started walking out the door. I walked towards the downtown area of town, which at that time really wasn't a safe thing to do. There were a couple of bars that were very rough and tumble. None of the students would go into those bars. There was one bar that was rumored to be a place where women were lured into the bar and assaulted. I was almost to the downtown area when a white Cadillac pulled up. A guy that was dressed in a white tux and white bow tie asked me if I needed a ride home. He told me to get into the car. I got into his car and then spread out on the back seat to sleep. This was before seatbelt laws. I remember him saying that he'd seen me walk out of the student union building and was concerned about my safety. He told me the downtown area was unsafe for women who were alone, and that he was there to protect me from harm. I remember seeing visions of what could have happened to me being in a dangerous area. This was very vivid and not specific to the downtown area where I was. They started out in a downtown area and then ended up on the beach. These visions were not of me. I saw a woman at a nightclub who had been drugged and hours later woke up on the beach naked and not knowing how she got there. It was very dark out and she was on the beach in the dark. She starts to cry and then screams. No one seems to hear her screaming for help. I woke up and I'm in a strange car. I went back to sleep. I saw the interstate which goes to the beach. Then I saw a woman who had been held against her will for several hours by several men. After dark she was taken to a boat where she was tied up and bound in a way that she will go to the bottom of the ocean. She is then dumped into the ocean to drown, but somehow survives. The waves and a force pulls her back to the shore, and she is able to roll her body until she's in a safe area. She survives. The men got back to the shore and carry on as though nothing has happened. I wake up and I see the ocean. It looks like this guy is driving on the beach at night. I go back to sleep. The last vision I see is a woman being threatened with a knife at a beach house, who escapes running down the beach and gets away. When I woke up, the car was pulling into my grandmother's driveway. I never told this guy where I lived, and don't know how he knew where my grandmother's address, which was 15 miles away from the party, was. My grandmother thinks this guy is someone I know, and she talks to him briefly. She knows that something is off with me. When I get into her house, she realized that something isn't right. She asked me if someone gave me drugs. I told her no. Then she starts tapping my face with her hands so that I don't go back to sleep. She looks at me and asked if someone at the party attacked me. I said no. She asked me if someone put some alcohol in the punch at the party. I said, probably some drink which has no smell. She then asked me who the guy was and I told her I didn't know. The next thing she says was my guardian angel was looking out for me. As this guy could have harmed me or done anything, and if I had survived, I wouldn't be able to tell anyone much about him. After a couple of hours, I went to sleep. Woke up the next morning and was fine. I get my car the next day. I asked people at the party and no one knew this guy nor had anyone seen this guy at the party or on campus. To the angel dressed in a white tux, white bow tie, driving a white Cadillac, I thank you for protecting me from harm. 2. So I live in a haunted house, but it's a pretty good one. Some cold spots here and there, occasional shuffling footsteps, breezes when all the windows are closed. You get the idea. I have always practiced magic, but I never wanted to work with spirits. It's very hard to close that door once you open it. I was scared of the concept, and I knew that fear was a huge risk to me. So even though I had the potential, I kept that door shut, locked, and chained. Then I hit a point in my life where I really hit rock bottom. Besides being too emotionally dead to be afraid anymore, I was also really painfully lonely. So I decided to try spirit communication. 
I made a pendulum board to use and used my pendulum to see if there was anyone around who wanted to chat. I encountered two spirits, one called Saul or Solomon, that wasn't very chatty and only seemed to be passing through once, and the other identified themselves as L.A.N. I wasn't sure if those were initials or part of a name, I just called him Lan. Over time we developed a bond, I suppose. I lit candles for him, I left offerings of moon water and cigarettes. Lan has a real penchant for cigarettes. I usually roll two, light them both, and leave one to burn out on the ashtray, relighting it as needed when I smoke mine. Even when I didn't have the pendulum out, I spoke out loud to him often, read to him, learned his favorite songs and made a playlist of them, and even danced with him to it a few times. It was lovely. One time I was packing to go on holiday, and in one of my makeup cases I found the chain for my favorite pendant, which I had lost. I went to get the pendant which I kept in a specific spot on my display shelves and altar, and it wasn't there, which was really odd. I gave up looking for it after about ten minutes. I put the chain on, sans pendant, finished packing, and left. When I came back, the pendant was sitting bang in the middle, taking pride of place on top of the shelving unit. I know for a fact it wasn't there when I left. I left a thank you note and a cup of moon water out, and made sure to roll him a smoke that night. The next thing that happened was I got my kitten. I have an older cat who's allowed outside, but the kitten was too small. She was asleep when I walked past her on my way out for my last smoke before bed, and all the lights were already out. My adult cat followed me and wanted to come out as well. I stood there holding the door for him, but he just stood in the doorway like an idiot. So I propped the door open with a shoe and sat down to roll a smoke. My seat is right next to the door, so I figured it'd be fine because I'd see the kitten if she tried to go out. The next thing I know, I'm halfway through rolling and my smoke alarm started going off. I looked up just in time to notice my pitch black kitten sneaking out the door in front of me. As soon as I saw her, it stopped. I brought her inside, I checked to make sure the stove and oven were off. There was no smell of smoke in the breeze and... I hadn't even lit my cigarette yet. I knew the smoke alarm was fine, because it's a rental and where I live landlords have to get them tested and serviced frequently. Mine had been done three weeks prior. Haven't had an issue with it since and it's been months. Anyway, I said thank you and rolled a second smoke that night. It was a very still night and my porch is relatively enclosed, but I didn't need to relight it once. The amber glowed like someone was taking a drag the whole time and it burned down to the filter before I even finished mine. A few weeks later, I was talking to my neighbor, who's lived next door for fifteen odd years. She was complaining about the previous tenants, the landlord's mother and partner. She told me the grandfather came to live there too and tried to kill himself under the house twice, because he was dying of terminal cancer. I asked if he was a smoker and she said yes, he died of lung cancer. And guess where he died? The room that's now my bedroom. I said that's very interesting, because some things have happened in this house that make me feel like I'm not alone in there. She said, Me too, ever since he died. Some nights I'll be trying to sleep and I can hear it. The song he always used to play. It's not classical, but it's not really rock and roll either. It has piano. I had already opened Spotify as she was talking and started playing Piano Man. That's it! That's the song! No kidding. Do you remember his name? It was Ian, I think. My face when I'd been calling my new friend the wrong name because of a divining board typo for the better part of a year. 3. So I've had a series of minor, paranormal, or unexplained experiences over the years. This experience is perhaps the most memorable to me. Additionally, I am something of a fan and semi-aficionado of the paranormal. A brief backstory. I graduated from college outside of Washington, D.C. in 2011. At the time my grandmother's, we'll call her Mima, health was sharply declining. Definitely normal for a nonagenarian born during World War I. We had formed something of a bond, one that was stronger than most of our extended family. She had a significant impact on my life, and she always appreciated me being the present and doting grandson. Me and my family moved her into hospice care and I moved into the house and paid rent to cover the general upkeep, as the house had been paid off for decades. Sadly, but not unexpectedly, 
She passed from natural causes in October of 2011. I sat with her in her final moments. While sad, the entire funeral experience gave off a celebration of life vibe. The night of her passing, I went home to my and her house and prepared to go to sleep. I had decidedly moved in to what was once my grandmother's childhood room. It seemed fitting. My friend, Jenny, had moved in with me and occupied my grandmother's master bedroom. Before going to sleep, I had a habit of watching a few YouTube videos on my laptop. I usually shut the computer down and placed it half-closed on the lower shelf of my nightstand. I had charged the laptop completely prior to unplugging it. After midnight, I remember waking to the sound and light of my laptop cold booting on its own. After staring at it inquisitively, it proceeded to turn off, the battery having completely drained in less than a couple of minutes. I plugged it back in and rebooted it, only for it to show that the laptop was charging with 1% power remaining. I didn't think too much of it, although I recall several stories of spirits being capable of quickly draining video camera batteries. I went back to sleep, but was sharply awakened at just after 3am by what could be best described as a guttural moaning noise that emanated throughout the room. At the time I was home alone, Jenny having gone to North Carolina to visit her new boyfriend. I distinctly remember sitting bolt upright as the volume of the noise was like that of someone talking directly into my ear. I was shocked into not being able to move. I sat there for a few minutes waiting for something else to happen. After calming myself enough to try to sleep again, I heard the loud guttural moaning accompanied by loud knocking noises throughout the house. Out of both shock of what it could have been, and the idea that maybe someone was trying to break in, I went into my safe and loaded my 12-gauge shotgun, and got my phone ready to call 911. The moan occurred one more time and I realized that it wasn't anyone pranking me or breaking in. I set my shotgun down, as I realized this had to be Mima playing one last visit to the home that she had lived in since the 1950s. She was heavily attached to her home, and did not want to leave. I muttered goodbye to her as the sound stopped. Still shaken, I turned on all the lights and went downstairs to watch TV until sunrise. Her funeral services were the following Sunday. Sitting in the pews, I told my two younger cousins about what I had experienced. Their eyes widened and they didn't want to hear any more. Perhaps they were afraid they'd experience the same. I told my parents. Oddly, my mother was not the least bit surprised and accepted exactly what I thought. That it was simply a final goodbye before crossing over. The activity more or less subsided in the following days. However, Jenny and a few friends that spent the night over the next year did mention the feeling of being watched and a few unexplained noises. I chalked it up to my grandmother being displeased, with her house being occupied by a bunch of strange twenty-somethings. 4. So me and my now ex fiance listened to a bunch of horror stories on YouTube. We particularly enjoyed the cryptid stories, and being in the South, skinwalker stories always give us goosebumps. Both of us were open to the paranormal and cryptids and such. Anywho, one night I'm at a buddy's house playing D&D. I've been there for a few hours when I get a call from my fiance. I answer and she's hysterical. She's crying and begging me to come home right now. She wouldn't tell me why, she just begged and cried until I said I was on my way. And to interject for a second, we lived in an apartment complex that had a small wooded area behind it. Our apartment was at the back of the complex, and there is a dog park with only a chain-link fence separating the park from the woods. So I finally get home and come inside and run up to her. She's calmed down a bit. She was no longer crying, but she was still upset. After calming her down a little bit, I finally got her to tell me what happened. According to her, she took the dogs to the park so they could do their business. It was about 10pm. She heard some noises from the woods, but just assumed it was a fox or a coyote. We've seen them in there before. Out of the woods, just on the other side of the fence, I walked into view. She was obviously very confused because A, she knew I wasn't home, and B, why the hell would I be in the woods? She called out my name, and there was no response from me. The dog seeing me started to excitedly run up to the fence. When the thing that looked like me started to shake, 
and not shake like when you're cold or you have shivers, like violently shaking. She obviously yelled at the dogs to come back and scooped them up and ran inside and locked the door before calling me to come home. We both assumed that what she saw was a skinwalker. I've never seen anything like it, but she swears on what she saw. Needless to say, she never walked the dogs at night again. 5. My wife and I were visiting London in late October 2006. Our hotel was in the Portobello neighborhood in the far west end of the city. The nearest underground station was a half-mile walk to Westbourne Park Station. Most of this journey was along Great Western Road. This road is an endless residential neighborhood, with identical two-story brick homes with enclosed front patios separating the homes from the sidewalk. In fact, the only distinguishing characteristic along the road is that one of the houses has a historical marker on its facade, indicating that the novelist Thomas Hardy lived in that house during the 1860s. At the end of the road is a small alley near the intersection of Westbourne Park Road. It's the only street that intersects the road for its entire length. All this description of a boring neighborhood plays a part in my story, so here it goes. We were returning to the hotel one evening around 9pm. The sun had already set, and it was a warm evening. It had been warm in London during our entire stay. Many people were on the sidewalk and in the two or three pubs located along the road. However, I wasn't paying attention to them. Instead, my attention was drawn to a dog that emerged onto the sidewalk from one of the bricked enclosed front patios near the Thomas Hardy house. I should put the word dog in quotations, because this animal far more resembled a wolf. It was colored gray and black, very shaggy with a gigantic head. I'm five foot nine, and this creature's head came up to the level of my hips. It wasn't the largest dog I'd seen in my life, but it was one of the most closely resembling a wolf that I have seen. This wolf, or dog, behaved strangely, or so I thought. It sauntered along the sidewalk in the same direction we were traveling, but always remained about fifteen feet in front of us. I thought that it should have easily outpaced us, since we'd spent the day climbing over the Tower of London and walking along the Thames. And we are not moving at top speed, but neither was this dog. It weaved through the oncoming pedestrians without any interest, and didn't stop to sniff or pee on a lamppost like any other dog on its own would do. It seemed to be on a mission, or at least, had a destination in mind. But it wasn't walking too fast to get to it. Finally, after 15 to 20 minutes of walking, we approached the alley that intersects with the road. The dog or wolf turned left into the alleyway. I was only two or three seconds behind it, but as I turned to look down the alley to see where the dog had gone, a man just suddenly appeared right before me. I don't know how the hell he got there. It's not a blind intersection where people can instantly pop out and surprise you, but standing right before me was a tall, older man with the most dazed look in his eyes. He stood about six foot four, was somewhere in his late fifties with white hair, had a tan, and wore a navy blue blazer, white knit golfing shirt, and green pants. He looked like he had spent his day at a golf course or yacht club. However, the completely stunned expression on his face told me that this guy didn't have a clue where he was now. He didn't even know that he had almost run into me. All he could do was hold his arms out to his sides to keep his balance and let out a low moan, as if he was suffering from extreme disorientation. Nevertheless, I looked past him down the alley to find the wolf dog, but it wasn't there. The alley, which was well lit, was empty. Instantly, I asked my wife where the dog had gone. She hadn't noticed the creature at all during our entire walk, or the man who stumbled from the alley. Granted, the wolf dog could have disappeared into a building along the alley, and perhaps the man had won too many stouts that night. But I couldn't help but wonder. Did I just see a London werewolf? I have experienced many weird things in my life, including some cryptid encounters, but this was a first. Maybe Warren Zevin was singing about something real in his song Werewolves of London. Thanks for letting me share this story with you. Perhaps one of you listeners can shed some light about that phenomenon. I haven't seen anything like that since that night, either. I wouldn't mind seeing something like that again. Just as long as I don't get bitten. 
Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 144. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. I'm going to be, um, because I don't really do subscriber exclusive videos anymore, I'm just going to be kind of folding those stories, as I've been doing for a little while, I haven't really mentioned it though, just into the regular videos. So the last couple of stories were sent in by subscribers uh, for this week's video. Uh, it also, uh, well, it doesn't really save me a job, because I actually send the same number of emails, but it does mean I have more stories to work with per week, instead of just waiting to do a subscriber video. And I think that's probably going to work better overall. It should also take uh, take care of uh, any grumbles from some people who don't like the fact that I used to enjoy mixing the stories in the in the subscriber videos. I liked kind of a grab bag of stories. And some people didn't enjoy that, so they're gone. There we are. In that series, I wouldn't say it's retired, let's just say it's having a rest. But the stories themselves will be getting used. Okay, now I should probably have mentioned this in yesterday's video, but what we're going to do is starting... What date is this? Come on. Okay, there, there we are. Behave yourself. Uh, okay, starting uh, probably in July, so let's check that date again. Uh, yeah, so starting the 4th of July. I almost said August there, but 4th of July. Uh, I'll do something else. So 4th, 11th and 18th, we'll have something else. Might not be the same thing every week. Gives me an opportunity to try something different until I find a new series it takes there. Um, I will try and do original ideas, we'll see. Uh, instead of just relying on my, my, my old faithfuls. And then on the 25th, uh, you can let me know what you'd like actually, is you can have 20 glitch stories on the 25th. Or you can have just another kind of random video on the 25th and later that week, maybe on a Sunday, I will put up the, uh, I'll put up the glitch video as like a, a bumper bonus video. Uh, and those videos generally go between 20 to 30 minutes, so that could mean you're getting a video from anywhere from one to two hours a month. It really just depends on how long they, they end up being and uh, what I've got to work with uh, every month. Uh, so that's the game plan for glitches. Um, as of now, paranormal will just remain as normal. Paranormal. Um, and we'll proceed from there. Essentially, I need to revitalize the channel. The fact of the matter is, it hurts the channel if I keep putting out a video that's underperforming, and if it's getting less and less views every time. Uh, as I did mention, a part of that is that people aren't being notified, but that's not the entirety of it. A, a lot of people just don't like the glitch videos. So I don't want them to go away. I want glitch fans to make sure they're... I want glitch fans to be satisfied. And I think the longer videos overall will appeal to more people. So that's what we're looking at right now. It does also mean it should eliminate those, those periods where sometimes you don't get a glitch video for one or two weeks just because I don't have the stories for it. Since I'm doing it once a month, I have more time to gather stories. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time... Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.